And yet another very lovely evening out there to all of you, my dearest of friends. It has been a very um, eventful last 24 hours or so since I uh, completed the Chapter 6 study of Amos. The tornadoes have ripped right through the Midwest, so a little uh, downtrodden during this, but I've best thing to do is Bible study, the way I see it. Um, let's pick up now in Amos 7, where um, Samaria and uh, the northern tribes are still being judged by Amos. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers, or locusts, in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Here the prophet mentions the first of five prophetic representations of what was coming upon this people. After the king's mowings is mentioned at the end of this verse, in essence, it is supposed that the first crop of grass was set apart for the use of the king's stables. And what is happening is the prophet is being shown, the Lord is showing him that he's going to send this locust, this famine upon them. And uh, the timing is really what's represented right here. It was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And the prophet is very distressed over this vision. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, the locust, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Then the Lord repented for this. He changed his mind and he said, Okay, it shall not be, saith the Lord. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. This was a worse judgment than the previous one. The locusts ate up the grass. The fire not only affects the surface of the ground, but burns up the very roots and reaches even to the deep. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. Now right here is what's being spoken of by a plumb line. It's actually a very simple tool used for checking how straight that a place is. It can be used for building up or tearing down. The plummet line was used not only in building, but in destroying houses to see which way that they may fall or crumble or whatever. It denotes that God's judgments are measured out by the most exact rules of justice. This plumb line is symbolic of how exact his judgments are. Here it is placed in the midst of Israel. That is, the judgment is not to be confined to an outer part of Israel as by tiglath Pilazar the king of Assyria, it is to reach the very center. Now pay attention to this next verse. And the high places, the idolatrous altars of Isaac shall be desolate. That's strange. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. But what is meant by these idolatrous altars at the house of Isaac? Well, Ellicott commented on this. The residents in the neighborhood of Beersheba, once again, at the southernmost part, not even within the northern tribe's territory. This is even below Jerusalem. They were coming down here to worship idols. And this was a sacred spot. The residents in the neighborhood of Beersheba may have boasted of the favor or honor belonging to them as occupying the home of Isaac and the birthplace of Jacob. So these exact judgments are to come upon the northern tribes for all of their idolatry. And then the narrative shifts and a bit of a biography is given by uh, Amos. Something that actually happened while he was preaching during this time. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel. Where the idolatrous calves were being worshipped. He's an idolatrous priest. Sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, the king of the northern tribes, saying, 
Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam, the king, shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also, Amaziah, now catch this, how it immediately <laughs> jumps from this. It doesn't even tell us the king's reaction to this. Also, Amaziah said unto Amos, so then the false priest comes back after telling King Jeroboam that. He comes back to Amos, and he says this, O thou seer, uh, prophet, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. Leave here and go there. Stop telling us these prophecies. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel. For it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. It's believed by the commentators because we're not told about the reply from King Jeroboam II at that time. We're not told about his reply, so it's, it's believed by at least Ellicott. Jeroboam treated the charge made by Amaziah with indifference, or perhaps with awe. It's probably one or the other. He either disregarded it entirely, or he was terrified at the uh, news of it at least with silence. In either case, he was silent. And so the priest of Bethel, Amaziah, takes upon himself to dismiss the prophet from the kingdom. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord. Now he's speaking directly to this false prophet, Amaziah. Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. And it's believed by the commentators about his wife, you see, whenever the enemy would come in, Assyria, they were just very barbaric in how they would treat their captives. And the women they would usually take and uh, prostitute around. So his wife would be as that. He's saying, no, we're never going to be taken captive and all of this. And not only will they be taken captive, but his family will just be treated in the absolute worst regard. Chapter 8. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. The visions are resumed as though the priest at Bethel, Amaziah, had trembled at the presence of Amos and had ceased to persecute him. So he just goes right back to preaching, it's believed. Amos saw a basket of summer fruit gathered and ready to be eaten, which signified that the people were ripe for destruction, that the year of God's patience was drawing towards a final conclusion for that generation. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this. O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, now listen to what these rich folk in the land would say, because they apparently continued celebrating the same traditions passed down by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all these. But they would say this, when will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. They desired that the festivals of the new moon and the Sabbath should be over, when they might not only return to their secular employments, get out of this religious stuff, it's kind of like people in church today, when's the sermon going to be over so I can go to McDonald's or Walmart or whatever, but that they might not only return to their secular employments, but pursue their search for ill-gotten gains. Not only would they go out for gains, but it's ill-gotten evil. A proof that these festivals were observed in the northern nation, even if they were disliked. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. 
The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. And this is a constant lesson in the Bible, and how we should be forward thinkers. Every, every single act that we do in the present, we should think about what are the consequences, what would the Lord have me do in this, what will come of this, what will be the reaction from this action. And it's a constant theme. Be, be forward thinking in, in all things about how there will be a payment one day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Now listen. I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, though these would come and will come even in these last days. But the emphasis is on a different type of famine nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. A much worse famine than anything. That leaves countless people damned. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Benson commented at this point, We should say at any time, at any time, that a famine of the word of God is of all others the sorest of famines, the heaviest judgment. It is not improbable that this threatening was intended to look further than to the judgment now referred to, even to the blindness which has in part happened to Israel in the days of the Messiah, and the veil that is on the hearts of the unbelieving Jews, not fully, but for the most part, after they rejected Christ, that is the, that's the worst type of famine that has ever existed. Verse 13, In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst, they that swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. Once again, pointing to this calf worship, just how much that the Lord was angry about that, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth. This is what they would say. And the manner of Beersheba, coming all the way down, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Final chapter 9 of the book of Amos. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them. Now this is representing the lintel, the columns, the post, representing the princes, the rulers over the northern tribes. And I will slay the last of them with a sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Verse 2. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them, meaning they'll not escape, these rulers, wicked men. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves at the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence, and though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And reading this now, after what uh, I've experienced last night, uh, almost 24 hours ago, during the, the horrendous storms that were coming through, I was actually driving to a uh, shelter at that time. And I was out in it for the hardest part of it for about 15 minutes or maybe a little bit longer than that. But 
it just absolutely felt like hours that I was driving. It was, I mean, I shattered my windshield. I hit this tree that was falling over in the road and, and there was tornado warnings everywhere. And, uh, I was driving on the road and I actually saw the leaves start to, you know, spin right in the middle. And I mean, it was blackness everywhere. Of course it was night, but it's a different kind of blackness whenever there's a, a huge storm that's just tearing apart every single bit of it went across like six states or something. There was one, to uh, one tornado that traveled, they said a record, I believe of 200 miles. And there were just, it was just like so much terror. And the reason why I'm bringing all of this up is because the Lord says you can try to run as fast as possible. You can run to the fur uh, furthest parts of every bit of creation, but I will get you. And this has a fresh new kind of a point to me because there was no escape. There was no escape. If the Lord so wanted to, I could have just been swallowed up easily. I, it felt like I was being swallowed up last night. It was so terrifying. But, um, and though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good, meaning for calamity once again. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven. Now stories meaning steps up to the third heaven. And hath founded his troop in the earth. That's it thought to mean the animated creatures upon the earth, the troop. And it's believed that there's a connection right here, the steps from earth up to heaven, or it could just mean that there are these steps or stories in heaven. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kerr? Very interesting point right here. Uh, Kaftor, the Philistines, it's believed Kaftor pointing toward the island of Crete, just off the Grecian lands right here. But anyway, um, pretty good point right here how the Lord is talking about how we always hear about the Israelites being brought out of the land of Egypt and taken to the promised land. But right here, we're told how the Lord moves all nations and he migrates this one and this one. He does the same thing to every nation. He places these people, even the Gentiles in these places where he wants them. And uh, th this happens everywhere. We just only read about it in scripture because scripture is primarily written by the Jews. But let's quickly analyze this first point. Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me? Israel had presumed on the special favor of the Lord. The prophet asked them whether, after all, they are better or safer than the Ethiopians whom they despise. He who led Israel from Egypt also brought the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kur. God moves all. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord, pointing toward the remnant. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Every one of the remnant will be brought out. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Their primary rivals and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Now this is pointing towards the latter days, whenever Christ will reign over the earth and the prophets, they do this continually. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. 
Now, this is mainly pointing towards its believed prosperity during the Messiah's reign. So rapidly will the harvest follow the plowing. These closing verses foreshadow the glories of the restored kingdom of David under Messiah. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, meaning he'll bring all those scattered into the land, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. What a very marvelous world that it's going to be when Christ rules over it, my friends. After seeing what I did last night, I told my family, I said, I'm mentally exhausted. It was just such a draining experience to be that frightened for just a a seeming a relatively short period of time. And I mean, just that terror just drained me. I mean, we, we were all pretty frightened. But um, to know that under Christ, there'll be no more fear like that is just such a an overwhelmingly joyful thought. I may never, ever again experience fear, stress, worry, any of these things. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, very, a very good book, the book of Amos. Very frightening in many parts, but uh, stands out, I believe, among the minor prophets. I thank you all for joining me. Once again, my dear friends, Lord willing, we're going to be picking up in some of the other minor prophets, if he so wills, here in the coming days. God of peace be with you all and be safe. Amen.